Can you hear me now? No? A little bit? Are you messing with me, Tristan? I think he is. All right. Is that too hot? Yeah. Whatever. As long as they can hear me out there. You ready? Let's do it. All right. So we're going to start this morning in Romans 4. Uh, just as a reminder, um, we have that tithely link there on our streaming. Uh, if you click that, you can tithe into this ministry, and we do, we appreciate that. Uh, we honor God with our giving, our time, and our offerings. Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this manner? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. We've kind of really hammered that point home in our youth group time on Wednesday nights. So let's turn now to Luke 24. The last two weeks, we've heard testimony from three people that Jesus is risen, as we have walked through the life of Jesus. Jesus has revealed his resurrected self to Mary Magdalene, a woman who would not stop until she found him. And two, it's too early, it's too early, two on the road to Emmaus that could not stop talking about him. These are the first people that Jesus revealed himself to. He did not go on a tour to the Pharisees and the religious leaders and go, ha ha, your plan failed. Um, he didn't do that. He showed up to people who still wanted him near, who weren't ready to let him go. The two from Emmaus rush back to Jerusalem and go tell the disciples what they've seen. And it's here that we pick up in Luke 24, verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. The impossible suddenly possible. The dead now alive in their midst, their Lord, their Messiah, seen by almost all of the disciples. And the first thing Jesus says to them is, peace be with you. God puts a priority on your peace. I need you to get that. God puts a priority on your peace. And how often do we let our cares, our struggles, our worry, our doubts, how often do we let ourselves be robbed of that peace that God would have for us. Jesus gives peace. He leaves peace in his wake. The word for peace there is irene in the Greek. It is the Hebrew equivalent of shalom. If you've, if you've sat with me for a while, you've heard me speak about this word time and again. It means wholeness. Everything working together for the good. But Irene can have another meaning too. It can also mean reconciliation of one to another. It is the word the angels say in Luke 2, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Literally, mankind, I'm coming for you. I'm going to reconcile you back to God. As Jesus comes among them in the resurrected self, and he says, peace. He's saying, your, your redeemer is here. The person who brings wholeness and the fulfillment of the prophecy stands among you and makes all things good and complete and whole for your good. That's just how he starts the conversation. It starts there. It prioritizes there. It begins there. As we, 
as we let Jesus come into the conversation, as we invite him into our lives, as we walk with him, it's the first thing that's going to happen. Peace. You're going to feel complete and whole for the first time in your life because that that thing that you've been chasing, that you've been wanting to find, that you've been longing for, it is suddenly there. This has been the plan. And now the Prince of Peace, the great reconciler of our sin, is now standing among these disciples who were just talking about him. And he said, peace be with you. And just like the time the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, did, that, did they respond to that well when they first saw him on the water? What was their, what was their reaction? Anybody remember? It's a, it's a ghost! Everybody freak out! Okay? Um, they see Jesus walking on the water, and their flesh has the opposite of Jesus' command. Our flesh is always counter to the will of God. Okay, our spirit longs for the thing of things of God. Our our flesh is selfish; it does what it wants to do. So it has a gut response here. Verse thirty-seven: They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. So where Jesus would have peace, he starts off with peace, and their reaction is ah. Okay, um, where Jesus would have peace, we can try to create a storm where there is no storm. If a storm ain't there, my flesh will make one. Because in this instance, it just doesn't make sense. I've seen this in youth ministry a ton. Uh, in some adult services, for that matter, as well. God will begin to pour out. Uh, well, I'll see a Holy Spirit outpouring on his, on his kids during a service. And his presence will freak some people out. Some people won't understand because they can't rationalize what is happening. In their physical minds, it doesn't fit their mold or how they think God should show up in a church. The church is going to have moments in Acts 2 where the world uh, will say, "Mm -mm, no, that's not okay. Uh, Just like in Acts 2 where because they're declaring the glory of God in languages that are not their own, the world says, you're drunk, you are drunk. If you're his He's going to speak peace to your heart. If you're the world's, you're going to keep on doubting. The disciples we know are his. And we know this because they can't stop talking about him. They run to the tomb. They go back to the tomb. He is their focus. And he sees their flesh react, startled and frightened. And he calls out their doubts. In verse 38, he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Talk about a verse right there to write down and commit to memory. You're going through something. You're you're struggling through something in life. Just write down the words of Jesus right there. Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? He already spoke peace. He already spoke peace to you. If Jesus speaks peace, wholeness, harmony, reconciliation over you, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? Guys, this is as much for me as anybody else. I get it. It can be hard not to know what the next step is or not to know how it's all going to work together or how, it, how it's just, no, life isn't fair. I don't get why things have to be this way, why it's such a struggle. But guys, the next step isn't as important as knowing that God is in the room with you. And he says, he says, peace be with you. And you either believe that You accept it, you receive it, or you don't. The disciples are still having doubts right now. Jesus just called them out. He's there with them, and they're still having doubts. They still don't think they can accept that peace. Even among them, even with a resurrected Jesus in the room, doubt still persists. The NIV translation there says, their minds. But the more accurate translation is, why do doubts 
come up in the heart of you. This is more than a rationale. This is a, a core belief. This doesn't make sense. I can't, mm -mm. my innermost being, despite the truth in front of me, wants to doubt. And so these people that have sought him out, he meets them where they are. He helps them in their unbelief. Not the first time we've seen that in scripture either. Verse 39, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He, said, he says, look, shake my hand. Give me a hug. Use the senses that he gave you to know him. And again, the language there is just, it's better in the Greek. I, I don't do this a lot where I keep going back to, oh, it's Greek and Hebrew, it's amazing. And it is, it's awesome. The original translation is awesome. But I don't do that a lot. But here, it, it bears signaling out uh, because Jesus tells them to look at his hands and feet. And then he says, I am he. It's an I am statement. I'm so happy for Jesus there because a long time ago, guys, as we read in the Old Testament here this last year with the, with the kids, we saw a long time ago God's glory come down and shake a mountain and the people's reaction is to draw back, is, is to go to retreat from the presence of God, from the great I am. And this time the great I am stands among them and instead of shrinking back, they draw closer. They draw in. There's no separation. There's no fear. There's, there's only, okay, I, I'll know more. I'll draw closer to you. I'll, I'll step near you. There's no fear here. Only peace, only wholeness, only reconciliation, a call to know him. Verse 40, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Note that they didn't believe because of joy and amazement. Does that seem like a weird statement right there? Um, that's not the first time we've seen good news met with unbelief in the Bible. Actually happens quite a bit. Happens in Genesis 45 when Jacob learns that his son Joseph is not just alive, but also the second in command in Egypt. When really good news, when you, have, has anybody ever gotten really good news before? Like really good news? Um, when really good news happens to us, what's something we might say or that we might hear a lot of? No way. I can't believe it. Are you kidding me? Are you joking with me right now? Is this real? My cousin, Rochelle, who is awesome and I love her and she is a woman of God, she met a man of God who began to court her and pursue her. And recently we got to be there at Thanksgiving when he got down on one knee and asked her to marry him. And it is this beautiful moment. And you talk about good news. And we got to watch as the joy overcame her. And she's shaking. And she's so happy. And she kept asking, is this real? Are you joking with me right now? Which I think if he had been, he would have been dead. <laughs> but it's just that that for the joy, for the good news, it's hard to, to, to believe that it's happening right now and it's happening to you. But the man on his knee and the ring in his hand were real. It's just the news was too good. And that's what's happening here in Luke, times a million. Jesus alive, not dead. And their joy is so great that no, this, this can't be true. We're having a mass hallucination. And so Jesus says, okay, in his patience, in his love for his kids, okay, gonna have to make this easier for you. Got any snacks? I love that this is the litmus test. 
He looks like Jesus. We, we see the nail holes. We can touch him. But can he digest fish? Like, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> if he can, I think, I think I might trust this. I think he might be the real deal. It seems silly, but guys, this is so relatable. Jesus meets them where they are. You still don't believe? All right, bring me some food. Look, see, I eat, I chew, see, uh, not a ghost. Real, resurrected. Verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So like Jesus did with the two on the road to Emmaus, he connects the dots for them about the Old Testament messianic prophecies. And I love the verse there in 45. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Guys, this is something the Holy Spirit still does today. He is still opening our minds to know him through the Bible, the Bible that he wrote down through the divine inspiration of men so that we could have his peace. This is the promise that Jesus speaks to them that they are to wait in Jerusalem for. They will not be left alone. The Holy Spirit will be with them. So now to pick up the narrative, again, going in order, we're going to turn to John 20 to pick up the story. As we do, we'll learn that one of the disciples wasn't there. The one named Thomas we don't know why he wasn't there, and I'm not going to speculate about it. We just know that he missed this moment, this moment where there were many witnesses. That's a big deal. Many witnesses who saw Jesus. First Mary, which again is amazing because Mary's testimony would not have held up in a court of law, and God said, I'm going to show myself to a woman first. Hmm. And then he shows up to two on the road. And we've got three people that have come and have said, Jesus is alive. And now he's showing up to a whole bunch of people. They can testify to it. They can say, 100%, we saw him eat fish. Okay? It's, it's for real. You don't even know I was there. It's true. He is back. John 20, 24. Let's put eyes on scripture. Now, Thomas also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Strong stuff, right? Now, the doubt here is understandable because we just read that Jesus was in the midst of the other disciples and they still had doubts. But now the disciples are all testifying to this. It's, it's true. Not one, not two, but many are telling Thomas he was here. He was with us in the flesh. But he says, mm -mm, your testimonies are not enough. Now, let's, let's flip this. If you're the disciples, if you're the ones that saw him, how are you feeling right now? What? Okay, yes, you are feeling joyful. You're feeling joyful because Jesus is back. Jesus is back, and you're trying to get your good buddy, Thomas, who you've walked with for the last three years, to understand what you're saying, to believe what you're saying, and Thomas is, not only is he like, mm, I don't know, but he's saying, no. I, I got to see the nail holes. 
I got to have the most extreme example possible uh, for me to actually believe. So I, I would imagine the rest of the disciples are feeling joyful. They're also feeling frustrated. Why can't, why can't Thomas believe all of them? And they're feeling sad because they want him to experience the joy that they know. They're hopeful that maybe he'll come around. This is their friend. They've walked with him. They know each other. And they're telling him, hey, Jesus is risen. And his response, his doubt is strong. I won't believe until I see the nail marks, until I can put my finger into the hole where the nails were and can put my hand into his side. Did you notice there's nothing in this passage about Thomas not believing because of joy and amazement, not like they had in the last passage. It's not there in this text. All that's here is the stubbornness to refuse to believe unless there is tangible proof. Seeing it will not be enough. Eating fish will not be enough. And in this outrageous demand and disbelief, we see the amazing grace and love of Jesus. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Something I didn't have in my notes, but that just kind of occurred to me is, a week went by. A week went by. That's a week of them, of the disciples being like, no, seriously, he's here. He's here. He's here. He's back. Oh my goodness, you have to, yes, he's back. We want you to be a part of this. This is amazing. And the thing is, Thomas wasn't like, I can't, I can't hang out with you guys anymore because you guys are clearly, clearly nuts. You're crazy. No, we see he's still in the house with them. A week later, he's still in the house. He came back. He's like, okay, whatever, you wackos. I'll just keep coming around anyway. I'll just keep joining you. Locked doors, I love this, locked doors cannot stop Jesus from declaring peace over those that love him. Guys, your circumstance your hardship, your struggle, whatever it is you're going through, will not stop Jesus from declaring peace in your life today. The only person that can hold his peace back is you. Now, I wasn't there in this moment in John. I can't know for sure. But as I read this text, I can't help but picture a couple of things. There is a room full of disciples, and suddenly, Jesus. And all but one of them have been through this before, right? This, we saw that, we already saw this. We saw this happen, this is what we were talking about. And they're not freaking out this time like they were the first time. There's no, ah, oh, it's a ghost, oh, oh, it's just Jesus. Yay! Oh, Jesus is back again, right? Yay! Ah, oh, we love it. They're not freaking out. They're believers now. They receive that peace command instantly. All but one of them. Because for one of them, it's his first time meeting a resurrected Jesus. I wasn't there. But I bet a lot of eyes, maybe all of the eyes in the place, go to Thomas. And I don't think for a second there was judgment in any of their eyes. I think it was an understanding that we've been there and now there's nothing but joyful anticipation for what's about to happen. I think it was like that moment when there's an altar call and the pastor says, would anyone like to meet Jesus today? And someone stands up and comes to the front and says a prayer, and it's this huge deal. All eyes are on that person or those people. Why? Because if you're there in church when a moment like that happens, and chances are if, if you're in this place, you have been that person, or you've seen it happen, you understand there is something very, very special about the moment that someone else meets Jesus for the first time and says, I want to follow you. 
this person right now, right here with Thomas. This is the one person. When Jesus leaves the 99 for that one that is missing, it was for you, it was for me. When you get to see those moments happen, when you just get to be in the room when someone is meeting a resurrected Jesus for the first time, it's one of the best things that can ever happen here on earth, so much so that it echoes into heaven where the angels, it says, are rejoicing. And in this passage now, it's Thomas's turn, and Jesus is going to meet Thomas right where he is, stubborn, doubting, outrageously demanding Thomas, who set a list of demands that must be met before he'd believe. And Jesus didn't have to show up, but he does because he wants to, because he loves Thomas. And probably all eyes are on Thomas or Jesus or going back and forth like, oh, it's happening. Guys, it's happening. Oh, is the thing going to happen? Remember what Thomas said? Ooh, 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 ooh. Is Jesus going to, oh, he's, he's putting out his hands. Oh, he's going to say the thing. He's going to say the thing. And he says to Thomas, verse 27, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus repeats Thomas's challenge. Here you go. If this is what you need, put your finger here where the nail held me fast and your hand into my side where the spear pierced my flesh. The theologian Charles Spurgeon wrote about this moment. The whole conversation was indeed a rebuke but so veiled with love that Thomas could scarcely think it so. I love that. The same love that kept Jesus on the cross is the same love that brings Jesus to Thomas to help him in his unbelief. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now guys, that verse is for us. You and I have heard through a cloud of witnesses that came before us from the early church all the way back to the beginning of time all that testified of a Savior who would one day come and did and died and rose again. And I stand here today saying, I have not seen him, but I believe. I believe in a God I have not seen, but as others around me talk about him and invited me to know more, I encountered him. He came and he met me when I was far from him and did not deserve him. He revealed himself to me through his word, his people, and through his creation. I believe. And anybody else that says the same, you get to stand in that blessing. And if we turn to Romans 4, right back to Romans 4 where we started, we learn that this is the same one spoken over Abraham. It's the same deal Abraham got. Abraham couldn't be in covenant with God because of his works, but through his belief in God, through his faith. Guys, that is all you got to offer. That is what gets credited as righteousness. Each of us, are given a choice. God speaks his truth over us and we believe it or we don't. He calls us to do something and we trust him to walk with us, to be with us, or we don't. God told Abraham to leave and go to a place that I would have you go and Abraham trusted God 
and did it. It wasn't the doing that, it was, that was credited as righteousness, as we saw right there in the first passage of Romans 4. It was the trusting in God's plan, his goodness, his love for us, that God says, oh, your heart is after me. You trust me in your very core, your inner being. You're that one. Romans 4, 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. How much hope did he have? There was against all hope. None of this made sense. Everyone else, everyone else around him would say, that is a bad idea. <laughs> do not do that. And so we see an in hope that is only there with a heart towards God. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. When Abraham was told he'd have a child, guys, what was his wife's response? Anybody remember? She laughed. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? She didn't believe because the news was too good to be true. It's too good to be true. Verse 20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone. And here's the good news, guys. But also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. What a God. What a Savior that he would extend that same promise, the blessing, to us. That he would put it all down in a book that is being translated for every nation and every tongue. Written down so that, as John 20 verse 31 says, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. In closing, I want to speak to two groups of people right now. First, those that are struggling in their belief, struggling to trust his will for your life, maybe because of where you're at, maybe because of those hardships, those struggles, those challenges that I referenced earlier, or maybe it's just you're in a place where it just feels like God is so far from you. I want you to know just how far he's gone to be in the room with you. Even if you feel he's distant, that is the lie. That is, that is your feelings. And I can 100% tell you he, he wants to be there right now with you. Maybe it was this moment today. Maybe you just heard the scripture that we read to help you in your unbelief. I believe that he longs to reveal himself to you today in a way that alleviates that doubt. But that journey starts, that desire starts by opening the door to him. Through prayer, worship, and the word, you have to swing them all wide open, and he will meet with you. He will meet with you when you seek him with all of your heart. It's in scripture. It's his words. It's his promise. And he is true. The second group is, if there is anyone here, or online, and you would say, I've never met him before, but I would like to. I'd like to meet this God that 
you claim to have met, this God that stood among the disciples, this God that would still show up for Thomas, who, who it doesn't seem like he deserved that, but, but Jesus did. That's the kind of love that Jesus has. If you've never met him, and if you say, I'm, I'm the one, I would ask him to be Lord today. I'd trust him to go before me and be with me and lead me and guide me. If that's you, I'd just ask you to pray this prayer with me right now. God, I am a sinner. And I can't do this life on my own. I need you. I want you to come into my heart because I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose again. And now I want to spend the rest of my life getting to know you and walking in your will. I want that peace. I want that peace that you speak over me. And I want that joy. So I trust you and I step out in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. If that is something that you did um, today, go and tell someone. Go and tell someone. Share that, um, that you are different, that you are new, that you're, that you're purposing to walk with a resurrected Savior. And know now that if you believe today, if you made a choice to believe today, you now stand in the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.